Um, thanks for coming out today. Uh, the, uh, the purpose of this presentation is to give you a high level mental model you can use when you work with event loops. Um, I will be showing some snippets using actual code in probably five or six different languages, hopefully one of them you're familiar with. Um, we also, I use a little bit of pseudocode here and there as well. Um, I promise that not all of the examples I use are canonical ways of using that code. Um, I am not idiomatic in all languages. In fact, I'm idiomatic in almost none. So very few, one or two. Um, so the idea of event, of event loop is that you have these event sources and um, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna not gonna approach it that way. Um, the the idea of an event loop is that something goes around and around. That's why the, there's the word loop in there, and it receives events from maybe the operating system or, or events that you've told that you're interested in, and when those events fire, it runs code that you ask it to run. So now why why would we even get there? Let's let's. Uh, Let's see, is this? OK, just crashed. Ignore, just a second. Keynote. That is so unusual. Uh -huh, that's not it. There we go. OK. So I have uh, misunderstood event loops for over a decade now. That is my, this is my background. Uh, a couple years ago, I set out on a quest to thoroughly understand how event loops work. Uh, I failed, but I did learn a few things. So I'm going to share those few things with you today. Uh, we all have to start somewhere, right? Uh, if you're like many people, you start with something like this. I'm a programmer now. I wrote some PHP. I, you know, you load it, it, it works. It's incredible. Or a little bit of JavaScript, maybe. Um, so those are great. Uh, now, we don't always you know our tools well enough to use them correctly, but we're getting stuff done right, for our employer or for whatever we're trying to accomplish. We're solving real problems and getting real things done. Um, we learn how to read and write files. We learn how to query databases. We learn how to make a web request, uh, things like that. And we learn as we go, and eventually we learn better ways and more uh, idiomatic ways of our language. Uh, we, look, we learn how to use Stack Overflow correctly. Um, however, many programmers come up against an algorithmic problem that simply can't be, uh, that can be framed as, why is this so slow? Oops, I'm going to, sorry, I went backward. Why is this so slow? Uh, this is an example in Perl, um, or here's the same thing in Python. Um, and and ping, ping is a, a method that, uh, let's say, just does a network ping on a host. Now, why would this, you know, why is this so slow? Well, um, it works for our 10, you know, I'm, I'm the developer, it works for the 10 hosts. I can hit the 10 hosts, you know, really fast. Well, in, in production, we have to hit thousands of hosts. So why is this so slow? Well, it's because networks, right? Networks are just really slow. When we, when we need to ping something, we um, set up a ping request. We open a socket to the remote host, and we, you know, we wait for it to come back. It, it takes milliseconds. And, and this is why things are so slow. And if we're waiting for that, um, our code will be slow too. Uh, this has nothing to do with CPU. You can't, you think, okay, maybe I'll put it in C. But this is not a CPU bound problem. This is a network bound problem. You can make the CPU go as fast as you can, but once it leaves, the, once it leaves your computer, it's out of your control. So you're, you're just kind of stuck with whatever network is between you and wherever you're going. So what can we do? What we, what we start thinking of doing is what if we could do more things at once? What if we could do lots of pings or all the pings at one time? And so we start, we do, we look on, a, uh, we do what all good developers do. We go to Stack Overflow and we read that there's a fork function call. 
And so that allows us to clone our process and get lots of things done at once. Um, here, here's a completely non-canonical way to do it in PHP. Um, it probably won't even compile. But you get the idea. Uh, for, e for each host, as a host, uh, we fork. And then uh, we ping the host in the child and, and wait for the process to come back. Um, is this terrible? It depends. It's probably not too bad. Forking has a pretty high overhead. When you fork a process, you're, f you're not only copying your own code, you're copying the entire interpreter, uh, which can be non-trivial. Uh, you're creating new process, so the operating system has all that memory to copy. It has um, a you know, whole stack, heap, everything. It, it's, it's not a light operation to fork. But it does let you do lots of things at once. So if the cost of forking is less than the cost of your waiting, and you have that memory, um, this, could be a, this could be a good option. Uh, forking has some other complex things to consider. Uh, sometimes you uh, have to deal with uh, children or zombies that have uh, just didn't get cleaned up. Zombies is a real word. I don't know how many of you are system programmers. I started out as a system programmer. And Zombies was a word we all feared because it meant that we had forked a child and did not wait for it. And now it's wandering idly through the operating system looking for its parent. And, uh, and it's dead. It has, there's no way to connect to it. There's no way to talk to it. There's no way to kill it. They're uh, the well-named uh, processes of zombies. Um, no zombie. There's no killing a zombie, uh, unless you've got a chainsaw. So, so this can work, yes. And I've written dozens of programs like this to get work done in parallel. Um, but besides, besides the overhead of forking, um, oh yeah, so, so it scales up to a point of whatever your operating system is capable of handling. Uh, but, but a lot of that operating system is now consumed in, in context switching from each of those processes. And while your operating system is arguably designed to do that, it's a non-trivial amount of overhead. And then you're managing all these things, trying to wait for them to come back. and it, it gets kind of tough. Um, so, so then you realize, OK, maybe there's a better way, something a little bit lighter than a fork. Yeah, there, there is something better. It's, it's called threading. You read a little bit more on Stack Overflow and find that uh, threads are like little forks. Uh, they're maintained by the VM rather than the operating system. Uh, they, each thread gets a little memory to itself, but mostly, mostly shares things. It gets its own call stack. So it has some overhead, but not nearly as much as a fork. So what's, you know, what's not to love about, about threading? So if you don't find this funny, you've never used threads. Um, yeah. So threads are lightweight copies um, of, of, a little, of your little stream of code. Uh, threading is beyond the scope of this talk, which is a phrase I use when I don't want to talk about something nasty. Um, I've done enough threaded programming to be able to identify uh, threading problems in other people's code sometimes, but it's, it's rarely easy. Um, here's another one for you. Um, OK, so uh, here finally is a paragraph. Uh, I'm going to read this. It's, it's a big one. This is from Apple's uh, developer documentation. Another cost to consider when writing threaded code is the production costs. Designing a threaded application can sometimes require fundamental changes to the way you organize your application's data structures. Making those changes might be necessary to avoid the use of synchronization, which can itself impose a tremendous performance penalty on poorly designed applications. Designing those data structures and debugging problems in threaded code can increase the time it takes to develop a threaded application. Avoiding those costs can create bigger problems at runtime, however, if your thread spends too much time waiting on locks and doing nothing. This is like the third paragraph into thread management in Apple's uh, thread developer guide. Um, threading, in my opinion, you, you have to be a smarter than average person to do threads well. Um, you have to hold a lot of things in your head because there's a, these invisible um, code paths that are you, you can't see them. They don't exist in the code. They, they, they just happen. And um, you need to know where to synchronize them and split them and um, pay attention to variables, variables that might be shared between the threads. Because if you change one, um, now you've got a, a contention problem. Threading gets enormously complex 
very fast, and um, I never recommend it to friends except at dire need. Threading uh, does add uh, some real memory pressures and process overhead to application, but that often can, uh, sometimes that is the cost you need to pay for the performance you need. Threading is, does solve a legitimate problem. I don't want to say threading is always wrong, because it's not. It, it is the right solution for many, for many problems, um, it, but it, it does have significant complexity. Um, as I mentioned, threading really is for really, I've always considered threading for really smart people. Um, I remember trying to do threading and, and I got it, but it was never fun. And every time I've had to deal with threaded code, it's always un not, not enjoyable. Um, I've always thought of people who are good at threading as really smart people and um, you know, uh, the rest of us are just kind of pretending. So. Sure. You, yeah, ha handing it off to a, a queue or a messaging system. Yeah, yeah. There's there are ways to simplify things, and that's 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 true of all abstractions. But threading is very powerful. Um, but uh, in my opinion, it it it's, it's has a lot of uh, cognitive overhead, um, uh, not so much the operating system overhead. So, but you can see where all these things are going, right? We're, we're trying to do multiple things at once, and and do it in a way that that we can understand. Um, so if we look at our processor during that, during that ping loop, it's, it's just sitting there doing nothing. It, we, we send out, you know, we, it, it, it works for just a couple microseconds to build the, the ping packet and push it out onto the wire. And then it just, it just got to, you know, it goes into idle mode because there's nothing for it to do while it's waiting for that network response, which takes milliseconds, which is millions of, you know, microseconds. It just, there's nothing to, for it to do. So um, we, we've got to figure out a way to leverage that. See, if we, if we fork, then all of those processes are working really hard for a second and then waiting. So we're still not maximizing our CPU, except to the extent that we've now created lots of processes to do things. Um, so what, is this, what, is, what can we do here? Well, um, we have this thing called non-blocking I.O. Before we get into non-blocking I.O., I'm famished, so let's order some breakfast. I want to order some pancakes, soft-boiled egg, and some orange juice. Uh, first, we're going to visit the Blocking Chef's restaurant. Everyone loves Blocking Chef. He's handsome. So he knows how to, he's a great cook. He knows how to make everything. So he does things in order, mixes the pancakes, heats the skillet up, because that's what you do before you can cook the pancakes. You've got to boil the water before you can cook the eggs. Uh, then you can cut the, ju the oranges and juice them. And how long does this take? Uh, 15 minutes or so, give or take, because he's done everything in order. If, you know, if this were your restaurant, what would you do to blocking chef? He gets fired, right? <laughs> so we hire non-blocking chef. Non-blocking chef knows that not everything has to be wait. You don't have to wait for everything. You don't heat the skillet and, and just wait for it to heat up. You start it and then you do something else. You don't have to wait for the water to boil. You start it and you can do something else. Now he's mixing the pancakes. He's doing something CPU intensive here while he's mixing the pancakes. You cook the pancakes, you cook the eggs. Those just sit there. While he's doing that, he can cut and juice the oranges. Our breakfast comes out in six minutes and everything is fresh and tasty. He gets a sparkle exit. So uh, this, is, this is essentially what non-blocking I.O. Uh, looks like. You do a thing, and uh, well, that's going to go uh, take some time, so let's just start another thing. And you know, we, we start that going, too. In reality, what does non-blocking I.O. look like? Here's a semi-canonical example in Python. Um, we take a bunch of hosts. We would open a socket on them, set it non-blocking and start our connection. And then we would go into what's called a select loop, where we continually pull the list of file descriptors we have opened to see which of them are ready. Whenever one of them comes back with some data on it, we do something with it. We'll read from it or write to it or whatever. This is actually um, 
quite painful. In reality, you, you can use select or epoll or kq, uh, depending on the operating system and what kind of performance you need and what kind of overhead you are willing to tolerate. Um, but these are all just ways of getting notified when something happens. You, you do pull, you're, you're sitting there spinning on it, but, um, but it's very fast. And, and, you, and you can pull on all of them at the same time. And when things come back, you can work on all of them at the same time. This is, this is how, th when I was your age, um, we used to do this sort of clunky thing every week, uphill, in the snow, both ways, in C. It was awful. And, and we were happy to do it. Um, and this is still the sort of thing you have to do to get good performance in, in low-level uh, drivers and things like that. But the good news is this is largely a solved problem now and, and has been abstracted lovingly into what is called an event loop. You can think of an event loop as a while loop that pulls system timers, um, network sockets, file descriptors, um, signal, operating system signals. It doesn't actually pull the signals. Those are pushed in from the um, operating system side. But, but the idea is that it, it loops through all of the things that, that happen on your operating system or that you've asked for it to happen, especially uh, in, in this case, we're talking, thinking about network connections because they're usually the slowest things we deal with. But, but disk I.O. is astonishingly slow. Have you ever tried to stat 1,000 files um, or 10,000 files or a million files? It takes a while. Unless you can do it asynchronously, um, you'll be waiting for a little while for those, for those all to come back. So you tell the event loop what you're interested in, and then you give it some code, a callback or something like that, to tell it what to do when the thing you're interested in happens. Uh, writing in an event loop is it's different from uh, what we usually call imperative programming. The, um, you usually set, um, you, you give it these callbacks, and you just let things run their course. It's a, it's a really a different way of thinking about it. Um, most imperative languages support um, event loops in some way. Node.js is the obvious poster child. Um, yeah, Node.js, uh, everybody knows Node.js. Uh, you can't get around the event loop there. Uh, it is built into it, and you have to deal with it. It's, uh, there's no way around it. Everything is done asynchron asynchronously, and you will learn how to uh, code with an event loop. Uh, if, if Node is not your thing, um, iOS and Android all have event loops built into them. You can't get around those if you're writing an application for those. Um, Nginx, our favorite um, web server, is uh, one giant event loop. Actually, it's one event loop per thread. It's very performant for this reason. It uh, doesn't block on anything. All of your web browsers are, um, have event loops built into them, JavaScript engines. Um, all of your favorite programming languages. Um, even uh, PHP has a, um, has a React non-blocking I.O. library, which I was uh, surprised and pleasantly surprised to hear. Um, Python has uh, Twisted, Tornado, Circuits, Juvent, uh, probably a dozen others that are really quite good in their own way, all of them. Uh, Perl has uh, LibEV, LibUV, and wrappers around those for Perl. Uh, event, any event, IO event, Mojo, IO loop, uh, tons of others. Ruby, Java, C, they all have event loops. Oh, and then, of course, our favorite operating systems are also um, just big event loops. So everything uses event loops. Uh, they're fairly simple. Here is the um, Firefox main event loop. That's it. Uh, while someone has not clicked the quit button on the thing, we just are going to spin and process events. There's obviously more to that. Where else might we find event loops? Um, our devices and games. Here is a diagram I took from uh, Apple's developer documentation. Um, the user interacts with the system. You have uh, touch, drag, swipe, pinch, pull events. Uh, all of those, the operating system sees those events and adds them to an event queue. Your application can subscribe to those events and reacts to those, runs some code, and may um, push new events into the operating system that the operating system will react to as well. And then uh, the operating system will update and redraw the UI uh, in, in this great, glorious uh, loop. What else? 
if you've ever played uh, anything, if you've ever played a game in the last, you know, 10 years or so, it was probably, some of them were probably built on the Unity 3D engine. Uh, the, this is the game loop for the Unity 3D engine. There's, a, there's actually a, two loops in there. There's a physics loop that runs until it has caught up with the current frame. And then, uh, then just standard events update once per iteration. Network events are handled, and then redraws the, redraws the screen. Um, so you get, sometimes you get loops within loops to, to make sure that things can catch up and, and all feel synchronized. Sometimes some things take longer, like the physics stuff can take a little bit longer. And so um, it gives that a chance to catch up. Um, so event loops are everywhere. And everywhere there's a need for high performance, uh, both on the client side and on the server side. Um, every event loop has some subtle differences from this, but this is, this is basically a model we can work with in our heads. Here's some examples from some uh, specific languages. Um, the top one is jQuery. Maybe you've written something like that in a web page where you go and it does an HTTP get uh, of some page.html. And then you give it a function. Uh, when uh, the page response has happened, uh, that function is called. Uh, it, this one is Node.js. It's probably not canonical. I know there are probably much smaller ways that probably look like the top one, but I'm not a Node expert. Um, this bottom one is a, an example in uh, Perl's um, Mojalicious framework. It looks very similar to the, to the top one. So uh, they, all, they involve, all involve making some non-blocking I.O. request and then giving it some response handler. So they all do the same thing. Um, so let's, let's try to illustrate this a little bit. Um, this is a, this is not any language. This is just some pseudocode here. Uh, looks a little Pythonic. So first we start with um, our get. What this does is it creates a, this is our representation of a, of a, a web socket connection or a, or a, a, socket, a network socket connection. That gets put into what is called the reactor or event sources. This is part of the event loop. Um, your event loop interfaces with the operating system. So when you, down under the hood, what you're doing is you're just opening a network socket and you're pushing that get request through it, get, slash, you know, whatever the URL is. And then um, you're, you're done. Your program, as far as you're concerned, you're, it's out of your hands because now that, that, those bits are traveling over the wire and they're sitting somewhere on that, you know, heading to that other server uh, where your request is going. Um, so we've made our request. Uh, now we uh, also, at the same time, we register a callback or uh, some code to run that, that, we're, when, that we, we, we give this also to the reactor. This represents our code. We give that to the reactor. The reactor um, then says thank you very much, and we move on. Our, our, we move to the next statement in our code, which is loop run. Um, if you're using like something like Node, that's implicit. There, you, there's, you can't avoid loop run. Loop run is going all the time. You can't. But if you're using a, a more uh, uh, some other framework where event loops are something that you have to start, this is maybe how you would start it. Now loop run uh, gives us a, this star represents the, the loop. Um, it pulls uh, all of the network over and over. It goes around and around, and it says, OK, when is, are you done yet? Are you done yet? At some point, the network says, I'm done. Here's that request. And it says, oh, great. Let's push that code that, that, I, you, know, it, that you have into the message queue or callback queue. And those will then fire off and um, become part of our call stack. Um, we also, you can do this with database or disk accesses. It doesn't have to be network accesses. Uh, another thing you can do is um, timers. So um, where you would set a timer and off it goes, list loops, loops, loops. And when the timer goes off, we know about it. Code gets pushed into the event queue and executed. Um, advanced event loops, like the one inside your web browser, also receive events from the user interface. Um, besides timers, you have DOM parsing events, mouse events, keyboard uh, events. These are all translated from their low-level interfaces into something that the, um, the browser, some kind of a 
event class that it, it can know about. And so these high-level events are then put into the event queue and handled one at a time. Uh, if you, you can say uh, like an on key press event or an on timer event or whatever, and uh, your code will get executed at the right time. So we've mostly focused on um, client side. Here's another client side. Has anyone ever written some jQuery? Some of you have written some jQuery. So it, it kind of looks like this, right? This is, um, this is a standard thing. You have a, do you see a, a, a callback in here? So we make an AJAX request to Perl.org, and, and when that comes back, we fire success. There's actually two callbacks in here. There's this one. This itself is inside of a callback. You can see that the document ready is the first function we call. What that does is it says, hey, browser, when you're done painting everything that needs to be on the web page, run this function. So that won't happen until everything's done. So this is, there's actually two, two callbacks here. And this is the second callback. This is the one that will get fired when our um, network response comes back. This is uh, called um, continuation passing style. Um, it's callbacks and kind of callbacks. Um, it, it's, it gets complex fast. It, it's great for short, you know, little queries and things like that, but, um, or, but you, you typically want to use a, what we'll get into a little bit later, um, promises and futures and some other better abstractions for that. But, but the, that's the basic idea is that you're, you're, you're giving the event loop some code to run when you are, um, when the thing you're interested in has happened. Um, is if, is if anyone has a laptop, um, feel free to start pounding this URL with curl or wget or whatever you want. Um, I'll do the same. Oh, sorry about that. I'll pipe this to bash. Just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't ever do that, please. Even if a web page tells you to. Does everyone have that? If you're interested. You don't have to do it. I'm going to. I'm going to hit it to see if this comes over. I'll start pounding it here. See what it does. See if it falls over, first of all. That'd be awesome. Not too bad. Uh, I'm getting about 1,100 requests per second. So this is, um, we've, we've spent most of our time talking about the client side. Uh, we're going to talk just for a couple of moments about the server side. Um, I want to show you what, whoops, what you're hitting. This is what you're hitting, these four lines right here. It's a, whoops, what happened? Oh, yeah. I'm not actually connected to that server anymore. Um, this is a small um, Perl application. There are ex exact equivalents in Java, Python, Ruby. They all do the same thing. They just spin up a little web handler and then start an event loop. That's what they do. This is, this is the heart of what Nginx does as well. Um, and it's fairly performant. I mean, 1,100 hits per second is not a lot. I, I acknowledge that. But it's a lot more than you would get with like a forking model. And it's pretty good for a, um, a slow interpreted language like Perl. There we are. So. Um, yeah, and when you couple that with something like Nginx, it, it becomes blazing fast. It's uh, really amazing. So what is the, 
what is the best way to write code in an event loop? Um, a lot of smart people are really working hard on this problem. Um, I, we, I already showed you the, the callback problem, the continuation passing style, where you get callbacks instead of callbacks. It just gets worse and worse. The easiest way to use um, is, is callbacks, but the, the easiest way is not the simplest or the best way. Um, right now, there are um, promises out there. There were probably some talks uh, this week on promises. I didn't, I'm not going to go into promises or futures or anything like that. I'm just going to mention that there are much better ways of, abs of dealing with the complex event loop abstraction. And promises is one of them. Uh, futures is another one. Uh, there are a lot of uh, good abstractions out there uh, for dealing with event loop code. Um, at this point, I um, am completely open to questions. I'm done with my slides here. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so, so you talked about bowling, like looping. Mm -hmm. Great place to start. Yeah. So he has this uh, non-blocking uh, select thing. And uh -huh. It's been so long, I, I, I forget exactly how it worked, but it seemed like it would just wait until there were file handles ready to be written to or read from before it would, and then it would just go process all of them that were in that state and do something and then wait. It, it has to yeah. Yep. So there's there's a couple ways to do this. Um, in this example here, there's a wait parameter. Um, and, and I'm not an expert in Python, but I, I think it's similar in C or in, in, in Perl at least. There's, um, you, can, you can give it a, that, that wait tells it, uh, if, you, if you don't define it, it will wait until there's something there. Um, so it will, it, you'll, it'll hit this line and just stop until one handle becomes ready. Okay. Um, if you set a timeout th on that, it will wait up to milliseconds or seconds, you know, whatever you specify that for. And then it will go, got to move on. And then it moves on through the, through the loop again, does some other things, and comes back up to this while one and tries it again. Okay. So what, down here, you might be looking at some timers, too, or some other things. You know, just whatever else you need to be paying attention to in your program that needs to be updated besides these file handles. So I mean, if, it's just, if you're really just dealing with file handles, this is pretty close to what you would do in a non-blocking way. OK. Mm -hmm. So with respect to event loops, set periodic callbacks, like every 500 milliseconds do this, mm -hmm. right? So is, is it doing something like that? How, how, how would it approach the wait? Mm -hmm. OK, good question. Yeah, in, in um, you know, I have, some, I have some other slides from another presentation that might illustrate that. It's not Python, it's, it's Perl. My, my other presentation was um, yesterday was in Perl. Would that be OK if I showed that? Because the oh, syntaxes sure. are, are close enough that. Sure. Um, Uh, unfortunately, there's probably going to be some might be some baggage, some syntactic baggage. So in this case, um, uh, we you can see that we're we're setting we're we're going to pretend to be the Perl interpreter here. Okay, we're going to run the thing. You can ignore that. Um, now what we're we're making a timer. What the timer does is it, it um, this is that, that blue side is your reactor. That's, that's your event loop interface. You're saying, I want a timer. So in JavaScript, this would be something like set timeout or, or something like that, set, set interval, right? Whatever the right way to do that is. And um, in Python, I think it's set timer as well or set itimer. I don't know what the, do you remember? I don't the tornado. Well, I, well, in tornado, you just say periodic callback. Oh, oh okay. You specify the time and the callback. Yeah. 
Okay, so this is the, this is very similar to that. Um, oh, it's not precisely similar, but it's. I'll show you where it, where it is. Uh, so we set a timer. What this does is it, it creates the timer, and then it creates a watcher. Uh, this would be your your callback, and then um, then we move on and we start the start the event loop. This is a Perl event loop. You can ignore the the syntactic details of it, but the the same I, the same um, principles happen is that we go around the loop. At some point, the, um, the timer goes off, and the callback gets fired. In interval timers, that, um, that reactor source stays there, and it resets itself after that, after that timeout. So that's how that works. It just um, will, you know, it will go off, and it starts itself again, and, and then it keeps the, the callback stays, and the, it gets pushed back into the event queue again. So. Okay, so it keeps going through a reactor loop, mm -hmm. like periodically. Well, no, the, the, I mean, the event loop is always going around, waiting for whose timer has gone off. There might be hundreds of timers in there and hundreds of network requests that are going in and out and things like that. And it's just waiting to see which ones are ready. If no timers have fired, uh, usually an event loop will go through and it will, it will process timers first because timers... They're about time, right? And, th and that's the most important thing. You, you put that in there because you wanted to be notified when a thing happened at this time. And it's network, that can wait. But timers are a little bit more critical usually. And so uh, maybe it has to do with animation or illustration. So any timers that have expired since the last time I came around will be processed now. All of their messages will get pushed into the queue, and then we'll go around again. So as far as going around the loop, mm -hmm. is it just going as fast as it can go, or is it setting a timer to say, no. One millisecond resolution or 10. Yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to, I will say generally no. You don't want to crush your CPU with that's, your event loop that's, that's just doing busy so waiting. Nice. Most event loops have a little pause in there that will, that will actually sleep for uh, a, a, a millisecond or 10 milliseconds or something like that to give the other bits of the operating system some, some time to run in the CPU as well. Um, but um, have you heard of the, the C10K problem? Who's heard of the C10K problem? The C10K problem was posed in 2003. Uh, I can't remember the name of the guy who did it. You can search C10K problem, and um, it will pop up. It gives the whole uh, history of his proposal. He said, back in 2003, he said, you know what? We've got these really fast processors now, and they were fast. And we've got all this memory. There is no reason we cannot handle 10,000 concurrent connections. What is wrong with us? Well, and then he proposed a solution to how this is done. And, and really, Nginx was, I mean, didn't come from that or anything like that. But, but Nginx can do that easily because it, it just, it, it's an event. It, uh, the, the answer to the C10K problem is a good event loop with, that, that knows how to scale up its sockets. And it ha back then, select was pretty much all we had and poll, I guess. But KQ has come a long way and ePoll has come a long way. And we now have these really performant, scalable um, polling under the hood systems that can handle that kind of number of, of connections. Um, and I can't remember why I brought that up. But um, yeah, but, but it's event loops are, are uh, oh, I remember what it was. Um, he said essentially what you do is you turn, you, um, you, you monopolize this, the operating system with your event loop. You, you are the only process running and you do everything in your event loop, and that's how you handle C10K. That's been um, now changed to the C10 million problem, and that's how you do it, is you make a, your operating system does one's run, runs one thing, and that's your event loop, and it just goes around. You, you have the entire CPU to yourself, and that's how you can do it. You can, you can crush performance with that, with that kind of a architecture. So if you, if you really need to go high, high performance, um, you get a CPU, you do not share it with any other process, and, and you, just, you just crank through your event loop. Good questions, thank you. Any other questions? All right, that's it.